Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. It's good to be here in God's house today and uh, appreciate you coming and sharing and bringing a copy of the Word of God with you as you have come. I hope that you've brought maybe a guest or two with you. You ought to always be looking and uh, observing who God might surround you with that you might bring to the house of the Lord with you every week, uh, inviting some precious soul uh, to come with you. Hey, how many of you, uh, how many of you remember coming home from school to watch a program on television called Who Do You Trust? Let me see your head. You, you, well, there's a few old people in this room besides me. It actually was a, a show that Johnny Carson hosted for a number of years and he brought on board Ed McMahon with him when he came long before they ever went to the Tonight Show. Uh, they were doing a show called Who Do You Trust? The whole premise of it, uh, for those young whippersnappers in here, the whole, the whole premise of the program was to uh, come up with a phrase of who, who can you really trust? And that's exactly what the text is about today in Hebrews chapter six. So turn over there with me and this whole chapter really is dealing with that aspect of it of who can you really trust? I believe there's a huge, huge breach of trust in our culture and in our society. And it's really running wholesale. Marriages today are falling apart because uh, there is no basis of trust left uh, in the relationship. I'm watching it with friendships. Uh, people that ha were friends for years had some falling out and it eroded the trust in the relationship and when the trust was gone, they had no relationship. I'm watching it in the business community, if you will. Uh, you see it in every realm of life. In the workplace, you're going to go to work tomorrow and most of the time you're searching the atmosphere as to who can you trust and who can't you trust. Let me just ask you this morning, who do you really trust? Do you trust your doctor? Do you trust your lawyer? Do you trust your car dealer? Do you trust your pastor? Do you trust your kids? Kids, do you trust your parents? Because the integrity has gone out of the character of people's lives today, it's really, really hard to trust others. Uh, I kind of grew up that way. Uh, this passage really relates to me extremely well. I, my whole adolescence uh, was a searching, is there anybody around me that I can really trust when the chips are down? Uh, anybody around me that I can trust to carry it over in my adolescence, my teenage years, and into my young adult life. And as a matter of fact, it was major effective um, in the early days of my marriage until I learned who I was in Christ and who Christ was uh, in me. Uh, the passage today, I heard somebody say it a few minutes ago when I asked the question, who can you trust? The passage today has everything in the world to do with the trustworthiness of our Savior. Uh, that's what it's all about. So let's pick it up in verse number 13, if you will, chapter number six. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured the he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that, it, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever 
after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the writer, uh, in order to prove his point about the trustworthiness of God, brings up Father Abraham. What an, an amazing example that Abraham was to the trustworthiness of God. We know a lot about Abraham. Uh, I love studying about Abraham, and we know a lot about him. We know that he was living in the land of the Ur of the Chaldees, and God came to him while he was there worshiping the uh, pagan moon god. And he says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to get up now, and I want you to pack up your stuff, and I want you to move to a place that I will show you. Abraham goes over to Sarah. Sarah, get ready now. We got to go. Where are we going? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, God just told me to leave where we are and he'd show us where to go. Well, how long is it going to take us to get there? I have no idea how long it's going to take us to get there. God didn't say. He just said, I'll let you know when the time has come. And so Sarah said, okay, and started packing up. I, I like that kind of wife, don't you? <laughs> Now, Abraham's about 75 years old. And God says to him, Abraham, uh, I'm going to make your descendants uh, to number as the sands of the sea. He said in another spot, uh, I'm gonna make your descendants as the stars up in heaven. I don't know if you've ever gone out on a good clear night and just looked up into the sky and have seen so many stars, trillions of stars that are up there. God, God says, uh, I, I want to make your descendants just like that. So get up and move and I'll let you know when you are there. Now when God tells him that he's 75 years old, 25 years later, remember that, 25 years go by. He's 100 years old when the first child was born. I'm gonna give you the sands of the sea, so numerous children. Now, there's stars in heaven, but he's now 100 years old, and Sarah is 90 years old. That gives a whole new meaning to having children at a later age, doesn't it? <laughs> and so he's there, and this child grows, and God comes to him one day, and he says, uh, Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, over to the mountain, and I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice. Abraham, trusting the trustworthiness of God, heads to the mountain with his 14-year-old son. They get halfway up the mountain, and Isaac looks over at his daddy and says, Daddy, wait, wait, wait a minute, Daddy. We, we got the wood. Daddy, we got the fire, but we must have forgotten the sacrifice. Where's the sacrifice? And it about broke Abraham's heart. And he just couldn't tell him that you're the sacrifice. God will provide. They get up there and they build the altar and this submissive young teenage boy who could have very easily overpowered his 100-year-old daddy submitted to his father was bound and was placed on the altar. And about the time that Abraham was to take that knife and thrust it into the chest of his son that he loved with all of his heart, he heard a little rumble over into the bushes and there was a ram and God says, hang on a minute, Abraham. You've passed the faith test. I know that you trust me. Now in the previous verses leading up to uh, verse 13, the writer of Hebrews is saying to the nation of Christian people that had turned to Christ out of Judaism, don't go back into Judaism. Don't lapse back into that. Don't veer off and don't stray away. Stay faithful. You can trust the trustworthiness of God. God will keep his promises to you. Uh, I want to ask you this morning, do you trust God? Do you really trust God and lean not into your own understanding? In all of your ways, you acknowledge him and he's directing your path. Now, you know that in your mind. You know that in your heart. But I wonder how many of you really put it into practice. 
How real is it to you? How true is it to you? Or do we, when something happens, do we get all worked up and we get all anxious and we get overcome by anxiety. We start biting our fingernails and, and, and get sick to our stomach because we don't know what to do. Do you really trust God? I, I wanna give you out of this passage this morning, I wanna give you four reasons why you can trust the trustworthiness of God. First of all, I want you to know that you can trust him because of his person, because of who he is. Verse 13 again says, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. He's talking about the integrity of himself. That's a powerful thing. You, you see, he, 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 you, you, gotta, you gotta understand that God invented truth. God drew it up on the architectural drawing boards of eternity. He said, I am the way, I am the truth. God is truth and he says in his word that it is impossible for him to lie in Titus chapter one and verse number two and then in James chapter one and verse 17, there is no variableness with God. He's not wishy-washy, he's not in and out, he's not up and down, he's not yes and no. You can trust him and who he is. You understand, when you don't know what the weather is going to be like, when you don't know what the economy is going to do or turn, when you don't know what your health is going to be like, in five years from now, you have no clue about your job situation. There is one thing that you can know absolutely positively for certain that you and I serve a holy, stable God and we can trust him. So they were tempted to go back into Judaism. They were tempted to veer off. They were tempted to stray. They were tempted not to be faithful in their walk with God. And the writer says, trust him. Watch this in verse 14, saying, surely I will, uh, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply you. In other words, God is saying, Abraham put all of his eggs into this one basket and he waited on the Lord and God honored his faith. Watch this, 15. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. God kept his word. 25 years later. I wonder how many of you would have waited 25 years. I wonder how many of you would have been patient and trusted God and depended on God and kept faithful uh, with God. Now, Abraham wasn't perfect. He wavered a couple of times, but he was a living and is a living example of the very trustworthiness of God. And God chose not to go back on his promise. I, I wanna tell you, friend, you can line up, mark it down, study them, uh, looked at them, researched them. You can add up all of the world's religions and I promise you every one of them have failed. But not one time has God wavered. Not one time has he not kept his promise. Not one time did he go back on his word. So when God says that if you will repent of your sins and place your faith and trust in me, I will save you. God says, I will keep you. God says, I will sustain you. God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He says in his word that he's going to come back and I could go on and on and on and on. God has never failed to keep a promise. Let me talk to you about the second thing, not only because of his person, but because of his pledge. Watch this in verse 16. For men verily swear by the greater 
and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Now, keeping an oath is what men do. And the reason they have to make an oath is because there's not much integrity going around uh, that they would keep their word. So these Jew, Jewish folks, would uh, they would swear by all kinds of different things. They, they would swear uh, by the holy of holies. They would swear by the temple. They would swear by the priest. And oftentimes they would evoke God's name into the process and they would swear by the name of God and, and they would use that as an oath to a binding agreement with somebody along the way. And, and, and very rarely was, were those oaths ever gone back on. The reason being, if they didn't keep their word, if they didn't keep their promise after having made an oath to the other person, then they would rightfully be killed. And so they kept their word. Now, you know, verse 17, the Bible says, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Now, from God's perspective, there was no need for him to make an oath because he was not going to lie. But in the midst of his infiniteness and in the midst of our finiteness, in order to accommodate our finiteness, he then made the oath. He put it down on a level that we could understand because God knows that we're really thick skulled at times and so he condescended to us. Now what is today's test? Here's today's test. If you're here this morning and you realize that you're on your way to hell, you realize that your sin has separated you from God. And you realize maybe for the first time your eyes are open to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ took your place on Calvary and he paid your sin debt. And you came to the place in your life that you said, you know what, I, I, I need to get forgiveness and you go before God and you repent of that sin and you turn away from that sin and by faith you place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, God says, I will save you. I will forgive you. I will write your name in the Lamb's book of life and I will eternally secure your place in glory. What God says he will do, he'll do it. Down through my ministry, I've had to deal with uh, people who had lots of doubts about their salvation. I remember one man, that one young man in particular, uh, watched him grow up from just a baby and uh, he would come to me periodically uh, as a teenager and as a young adult and even time after he was married, he'd come and every time my phone would ring and uh, my assistant would say, well, you heard from Bob today, and that's not his real name, but you heard from Bob today, he, he wants an appointment. I already knew why he was coming to see me because he was dealing with doubts about his salvation. And I met with him dozens of times and talked to him dozens of times about his relationship with Christ. And I would say to him, Bob, listen, your salvation is not dependent on whether or not you feel saved. You understand, it's not based on some euphoric experience. Listen, I like goosebumps as much as the next guy. I love it when the Spirit of God gets on me and, and, and the hair stands up on my arms. I, I love it when tears begin to flow and I get wrapped up in the Spirit of God and, and I sense his presence. I, I love that. But that is not dependent on me being saved or not. He finally, finally realized that 
His salvation was not based on feelings, but his salvation was based on what God said that he would do. That's what God does. The only way you can be sure is out of the word of God. And if you have complied to the conditions, if you have repented of your sins, if you have turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, placed your faith in him, God says you are saved whether you feel like it or not. You gotta trust the word of God. Let me give you number three. You can trust the trustworthiness of God because of the protection of God. Watch this in verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold or lay upon the hope set before us. Take your pen and circle the little word fled. Maybe draw a line out to the margin of your Bible and write the word grasp or to grab or to lay hold to. Now, what this passage of scripture is referring back to is in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and the first seven verses. God says to the nation of Israel, okay, I want you to get good and settled And when you get good and settled and get situated, I want you to set aside three cities of refuge. And let me quickly tell you that those cities of refuge are a lot different than the cities of refuge that we are hearing about today. And he says, here's the reason for them. Uh, If somebody, and he gives the example in Deuteronomy 19, If somebody is out in the woods and they are chopping wood and the ax head falls off of the handle and it hits somebody and accidentally kills them, to keep somebody from uh, acting revengefully, uh, that person runs as fast as he can to the city of refuge. If it's an accidental killing, go to the city of refuge. He says there, and, 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 and he says, I want you to just stay there. And uh, by the way, there, there will be a trial that will happen there in the city of refuge. And you will stay in that city of refuge until the current high priest dies. At which time that person is free to leave the city of refuge and live his life without any kind of repercussions coming upon him for what had happened. Now, I've told you numerous times that the Old Testament has a lot of typology about it that is conveyed to a New Testament truth. And here is in Deuteronomy chapter 19, hope you'll write that down, go home and read it sometime. Uh, Here's one of those areas where it is a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus himself. Now, understand that our high priest is a lot different than the Old Testament high priest. The Old Testament high priest would go in once a year from the holy place into the holy of holies carrying an acceptable sacrifice that he would offer up unto God for the sins of all of the people. And all it did was just roll it forward for another year. But our high priest, according to the word of God, uh, entered in once into the holy place. Once to secure our eternal salvation. I'm bothered today about the drug epidemic in our country. I I don't know of a home anywhere that it has not touched and infiltrated. I think if you think about it for a moment, every one of us in this room could identify somebody in our family that has been stricken with the malady of drug addiction. Our president and the uh, administration in Washington on on Capitol Hill, they're doing all that they can to uh, deal with this 
epidemic and stopping the fentanyl from coming into our country and dealing with prescription drug problems and the meth issue and the horrible heroin addiction that has resurfaced in our culture. And, and, and they're having all kinds of meetings and seminars and assemblies trying to figure out ways and means to deal with it. And if you turn your television on and if you turn your radio on, uh, you're hearing all of the talk show people actually dealing with some of the people who have fallen into that area of life. And they're saying, well, how have you been managing it in the past? And you would hear answers such as, well, I've been in rehab for the last three and a half years. Or I, I, I've been in counseling for the last seven years. And what are they telling you? Well, <laughs> there's not much anybody can do. And, and that's kind of, where it's happening. They're just throwing up our hands. We don't know what to do. I, I want to tell you, friend, we have an answer. And, and this missing truth that is uh, in our culture today needs to be uh, permeating our culture. This truth that there is one way to be set free from the bondages and the addictions and the strongholds and his name is Jesus. And when we run to that city of refuge and we get covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, we can overcome whatever it is that Satan has erected in our hearts and in our lives. <laughs> Verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul I want to stop right there because I want, you to, I want you to underline something one more time for me. Notice what he says, which hope we are going to get one of these days. Is that what it said? He's writing to us as his children, which hope as his children, born again, blood washed, we have it. It's ours, which hope we have. You don't have to struggle to get it. I met with a young lady between services, a little bit late getting out of here because of dealt. She's just struggling with, with, with I, I, I'm having so much anxiety and, and I'm having so much difficulty and, and, and she doesn't realize that it's Jesus already in her. We, we have that hope. You may not be aware of it. You may not be plugged into the fact that you have it, but if you are a born again child of God, you already have this hope as an anchor. He's saying that the object of our hope is not a program. It's not a series of steps. It's a person, and his name is Jesus, our high priest, who has passed through the veil, who is in the holy of holies, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, and the spirit of God has taken up residence in your heart and in your life. Our hope is what happened when Jesus figuratively went into that holy place. I want to read that passage I quoted a minute ago. I can't help but just speak from it in chapter number nine in verse 12. He says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood has entered in once into the holy place, having obtained, listen, 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 having obtained eternal redemption for us. Thank God he'll never have to do it again. You know, our, our hope is what Jesus did on the cross for us. Our hope is the empty tomb that he rose from. Our hope is in the fact that he ascended back to the heavenly father. That's good news. Ladies and gentlemen, get hold of this. Our anchor is not tied down here in this old earth. Our anchor is secure already in glory, in heaven. Isaiah 55 says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him 
and to our God. Here's that fourth one, for he will abundantly pardon. My daddy and his brother were brawlers. When I was just a young boy, my daddy came in. He'd been in some bar and somebody had taken a broken beer bottle and just cut him wide open. My daddy and his brother fought against each other all of the time. I mean, wicked. It's, it's not stuff that I'm proud to even talk about. There wasn't anything my Uncle Dave wouldn't do. He stole from his parents. He stole from my family. He stole from anybody. He, could, he, made, he was a moonshiner, a, a brawler. He was just all of it wrapped up into one. I went to the hospital when he lay dying. And I tried to talk to him about the Lord. Got back out to my car. Spirit of God says, you go back in. I said, okay. So I went back in there and I drilled down even deeper with him and he began to cry and scream so loud you could hear him all over the hospital and he called me Mikey, don't, don't call me that, but he called me Mikey. <laughs> he said, Mikey, God wouldn't want somebody like me. I can't even read my own name. I don't know how to write. I don't know how to read. And he kept saying over and over, I don't know how to read. I don't know how to read. I don't know how to read. But I told him, I said, Uncle David, it's not about you. It's about what God promised you. That if you would just repent, that you just turn away from sin, that if you just ask God to forgive you, he will forgive you, Uncle Dave. We can put our hope. By the way, praise God, before he died, he did repent. We can put our hope. You can put your hope in what Jesus did on the cross. What you going through today? What you facing? When you don't know what to do, what you gonna do? When you don't know where to go, where you gonna go? When you're looking for answers, where do you look? Old hymn we used to sing a long time. In times like these, you need a savior in times like these. You need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. His name is Jesus. Will you stand with me and let's pray together. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.